there we go i'll make a start so good evening everyone uh a warm welcome to you all on this uh on this autumnal evening um this evening i've got a colleague tim radford who's being my technical assistant he's going to let people in who are just going to arrive late and uh so tim if you um if there's any questions or anything like that, if you can pop them in the chat function, Tim will deal with any of those that come and happen. Um, I'm just going to try and confirm that I'm recording. Uh, yes, so um, welcome. I'll, um, I'll make a start. Um, so it could be another packed evening. Uh, it's a big, big topic, glaciation. and. Uh, yeah, I do teach glaciation in North Wales and I've taught for many, many years. Um, and this is the first time I've done an online um, session with this, but I've packed quite a bit into it because it's the format, the, the visual format of, of uh, an online webinar like this. Um, Britain's uplands have been shaped by many forces, but the most dramatic of these forces really is the impact of ice. And glacial ice has sculpted our uh, mountain landscape from the narrow ridges that we like to climb from our deep Uche valleys and so on but uh, they're the most conspicuous indicators of the past action of ice as an agent of erosion and yet we don't live in an environment where we have glaciers so how do we know so part of the talk is to look at how we actually can unravel and understand our glacial heritage so what I'd like to cover tonight I'd like to illustrate the various features that glaciers have created in our landscape from the mountains to the valleys and right down to our coastline. And glaciers have bulldozed their way through our landscape and eroded features, but they've also left their mark in the deposits they've left behind. So um, we'll unravel these features and we'll look at their characteristics as well. I'd like to give an overall picture of glaciation in Britain and the extent to which ice and glaciers have covered the land. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on a lot of these topics. I can't go into too much detail tonight, but um, we'll look at the impact there. And I'd also like to look and present some of the perspective with this as well. So looking back at past climates, world climates on a geological scale, um, which will give us a sense of, of where we are today and what our climate's doing, but also how we know, where's the evidence for all of, of this and, uh, and, and how it, it figures where we are really. I find it really quite fascinating. So there's a lot of science behind it. Um, but uh, as I say, we'll, we'll try and run, run through it all. I guess when we come to interpret our features, you know, how do we know we're in a glaciated environment? And a really good starting point would be to take a look at Glenroy and what are now very famous parallel roads. Um, and it takes us back to the Victorian time, which was an exciting time when the first kind of earth scientists were trying to discover and, and uh, fathom what our landscape has been created by and what the, the past process is. And they came up with all sorts of various theories as to the origin of this, these striking features, for instance, these three parallel roads on the side of the valley. Um, but because we didn't have any glaciers, we had to, the, these early geologists were trying to come up with their own theories and ideas. So people like Charles Lyell, Joseph Prestwick, and Reverend Buckland, as well as Charles Darwin, were all coming up with their own kind of hypotheses and their own ideas. Um, to describe and explain these mysterious features. And Darwin proposed that they were a former sea level, but he later changed his mind and accepted the view that they were lake shorelines. And it was in 1840 that a, a Swiss um, fossil, he was a fossil um, researcher really, looking at fossil fish, he was interested in alpine glaciation, a guy called Louis Agassiz. Um, he proposed that much of Northern Europe and Britain were covered in a vast ice sheet and when he visited Glen Roy in 1840 uh, he confirmed his theory that Britain was once a glaciated environment and he proposed that Glen Roy itself was once ice dammed. i just show the next slide there. We've got 
this is Glen Roy, and it's a, it's a proglacial lake. So as the glacier, the Spine Glacier, dammed the valley, this lake left evidence of lake shore. And as the ice level came and went, um, and it, it rose and fell, it left this imprint, you know, this impression on the side of the valley. So part of the evidence of, of our understanding, it's an ice dammed valley. Um, and South America in Argentina, Perito Moreno Glacier, you can see the vast glacier here and a proglacial lake. So imagine if that was Glen Roy and it was dammed by that glacier that blocked that water from, from exiting. So it's the same kind of environment that, that you would find. But we also come more closely to my home in North Wales um, and we look at um, Charles Darwin, who's quite famous in his, his journeys through North Wales. And he um, visited Commidwell in 1831 with an eminent geologist called Adam Sedgwick and they were looking for fossils and they were looking at marine seashell impressions that were in various rocks in the mountains and it led them to believe that the rocks had formed in an ancient ocean which had later then been uplifted by the earth's crust and big tectonic forces but these were only theories and ideas but they were trying to explain and then you know realize you know where our natural history had, had originated from and it wasn't really until Darwin had then travelled to South America on his great five-year voyage on HMS Beagle. And he was in uh, Tierra del Fuego and he, he was witnessing ice carving off huge glaciers into the sea. So he had his first impression of glaciation happening. But then when he returned to Commidwell, he noticed the distinctive erratic boulders perched on the lakeside. And I'm just going to quote from part of his rec um, recollections, actually, um, part of his writings about his, his time there. So we spent many hours in Commidwell examining all the rocks with extreme care as Sedgwick was anxious to find fossils in them but neither of us saw a trace of the wonderful glacial phenomena all around us. We did not notice the plainly scored rocks, the perched boulders, the lateral and terminal moraines, yet all these phenomena are so conspicuous that as I declared in the paper published many years afterwards in the philosophical magazine that a house burned down by fire did not tell its story more plainly than, than did this valley. So that was kind of, from a North Wales perspective, our um, beginning of our understanding of our, our glacial heritage. So before we look at the features that we find associated with glacial erosion and the processes associated with that, let's just take a moment to look at what is a glacier. So there are many definitions. But one I really like is that it's a large mass of ice capable of moving under its own weight. And I think that's quite a nice, concise, clear summary. So a glacier is a moving body of, of, of frozen water moving under gravity. So there's lots of terminology. and I'm going to throw bits of terminology at you through the evening. But we have a zone of accumulation. It's, it's up in the higher, cooler uh, where more clouds form as well so we get more um, humidity and precipitation happening so we get huge input high in the mountains then that travels down goes to the warmer lower levels where it starts to melt or ablate so we accumulate and there's a process of transfer and then there's a melting and we have this thing called a fern limit and that's the kind of equilibrium point where it's the inputs and the outputs and where it all, 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 all meets there. So in the UK, our fern limit is about 100 metres or so above the height of Ben Nevis in, in the image there. Um, so snow may remain in some of the gullies high in the mountains through the year, but it doesn't really form glacial ice. So let's think about um, why that is and what how does a glacier actually form so just before i jump there um if you look at that photo where do you think a glacier is likely to form and why so don't you don't need to answer that but just think where you can see a few people there climbing some on the ridge 
if you ever climb these 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 gullies they're very cold so that's more likely where the glaciers are going to start accumulating so it's temperature related as soon as you get onto the summit you're really happy to see, to see the sun and be in the warm so you're less likely to have them on the south facing slopes but you are on the north facing slopes so this little image here has from north wales we've got bethesda here nant francon valley and the ogwen valley so um and these little horseshoe shapes here are the small corries that form in the high mountains and if you see where this one for instance on penarola when come floor it's the aspect is pointing east and the one in Kamidwal or come Kum, come on there that one's pointing kind of northeast and northeast again so all of these comes are actually orientated to the north and northeast which makes sense really because they're the areas where the snow will accumulate and that's where the glaciers will fall. So if we think about the process of how the snow falls and it forms into a glacier we have our lovely snowflake here with our beautiful patterns um, then over time they get deformed. So the, uh, the snow is transformed to ice through a process um, and of the crystals get bounced around and knocked around and after a year or so they form this um, ice called a fern or neve. So over time the snow here becomes granular ice, fuses together and then finally fuses together into a glacial ice which may take 10-20 years um, but you can see on the next uh, image here we've got the shape of the crystals but also the amount of air so there's more and more compression as that glacial ice forms so we call a fern or a neve and it depends on the, the language that we use but there it's the the formation of this glacial ice um, so we had two main types of glacier and britain experienced both types during the last ice age and the first type is an alpine glacier um, so these are pulled down by gravity they form high in the mountains as you can see there so an alpine glacier moves slowly down a valley some of them are hanging as this one is in the alps it's hanging above the valley it's, it's not joining up with any other glacier in the valley um, if you see the next image some of them that fall down rock steps and so you get avalanches and ice falls and the transfer of glacial ice from a hanging glacier down to a glacier beneath. Okay, so there are our alpine glacier. We'll talk more about some of the, the features, how they're formed as well, uh, and the, the features associated with those. Um, the second type are continental glaciers. These are known as ice sheets or ice caps. Um, and these are vast. So there are two ice sheets on Earth at present, one in Antarctica, one in Greenland, and they're over 50,000 square kilometers in size. So an ice cap is a much smaller one. There's five ice caps, for instance, in Iceland. Um, and they spread out under their own mass. You can see here the two images of a cross section of the Antarctic ice sheet up to 4,000 meters thick, maybe five in some places, and the Greenland 3,000 meters. Very, very different shape, but they're relative to each other in, in scale. Um, and the ice accumulates but spreads out and flows out like it's like a, a plastic flow or and it will spread out under its own weight and spread and slide over uneven surfaces. So that brings to the point well how do glaciers move? They appear to be stationary but they're moving and some of them move quite considerable speeds. We're going to do a kahoot in a while and one of the questions is on speed of the fastest glaciers so I won't give that one away um, but the sheer weight of the thick ice uh, of the thick layer of ice causes glaciers to, to move very slowly and it's a soft material really compar comparatively with rock um, and much more easy to deform um, and but it, they, they flow down the mountains they fan out across plains and they can even spread out to the sea but they move in two essentially two ways so basal sliding where some glaciers 
or oh, sometimes a glacier, sorry, slides over a thin layer of water at the base of a glacier. The water may result from uh, pressure, the overlying ice, so you get a process called pressure melting, and then that gives it a nice um, layer of water where it can glide over the, the rock layer below. Um, or you get crevasses and water falls down through crevasses and helps to lubricate that base layer. So it's either pressure melting or you get water coming through crevasses. So the speed of a glacier will be dependent upon maybe the angle, the temperature and, and various other aspects. There's also something else that happens, it's called internal plastic flow or ice deformation. And this occurs at a kind of microscopic level and um, it's caused by the weight of the ice. And the ice crystals slide past each other, and then break off and deform and recrystallize, and they just move like this flowing kind of microscopic level. It's like a dynamic fluid process. And as they flow, obviously they're transporting material in the glacier, on the glacier, or beneath the glacier. So we'll talk more about depositions, deposition features later. Here's a beautiful example of a, uh, a Piedmont glacier, which comes out of a valley and spreads out, and it just illustrates this, this elephant foot glacier in northeast Greenland. It's flowing out into a lake called Roma Lake, and it just illustrates how that, that flow is quite plastic fluid move, movement as it comes out there. Beautiful looking glacier. So we'll have a minute of a video here just so you can get appreciation of how glaciers move. So that's basal sliding, time-lapse photography from a BBC program a number of years ago. I think it illustrates so beautifully how glaciers move and how, how quickly they're moving as well. It's very rare footage of subglacial processes. So you can see rock, rocks being dragged off the bottom, scratched and scraped along. It's the only bit of footage I could find with anything like this. It's, it's uh, a real fantastic insight and I think that's a wonderful image we'll come back to this in a minute but you can see that size that block there it's vast very it's huge few ton block just being transported effortlessly by by the ice so how do glasses erode and there's essentially two processes one is called abrasion a bit like sandpaper rubbing against a, um, a smooth bit of or smoothing down a bit of wood and the other one is plucking so plucking if you put your hand in the freezer and got out a block of ice that block of ice might attach to your finger if you then pull that block of ice from your finger it would pluck and it would break the skin and pull away some of the skin so that's plucking that's it's ice contact and it just plucks away or it smooths over and abrades. So they're the two ways that our landscapes have been created and carved by, by, by glaciers. And it's illustrated on this one feature where ice movement here, we can see it's going from right to left this way. And this obstacle is forcing pressure melting at the base of the glacier. The rock fragments are being dragged up and over and they're smoothing this aspect, the stoss side of this rock. And then as the ice goes past, it refreezes as it, the pressure is released. And then as the ice moves, it plucks away. And that feature we see all over the uplands of Britain. It's called a roche moutonne. And some of you will know that. I'm not going to give you all the names before you get a chance to, to, to name them yourselves uh, as we go through this talk. So um, you can see here the up stream side, the stoss side, and then the lee side where it's plucked. 12,000 years ago, the, the ice left this valley. So this has had present day processes eroding it. So they're not 
as pristine as they are where a glacier has just been removed. But the moutonne comes apparently from uh, a, the French and it's when the Whigs, the gentry in the, in the 200 years ago, so had 300 years, the, the French gentry had wigs, but they used this uh, animal um, or, or um, sheep fat to stiffen up the wigs. So they were called the moutonne and, and uh, sorcerer, Benedict Saucer thought they were kind of like the smooth and the ruffled sides of a, of a wig. And so we called them the rock version of this moutonne. Um, hence, that, that's where the name came from. And Saucer, of course, was the, he put the first Tour Mont Blanc together and he paid for the first ascent of Mont Blanc as well. So very much associated with, with cartography and the mountains and the Alps. There's also evidence on the minuscule scale of, of how glasses erode. And we've got here features of uh, scratch marks and these parallel scratches where the ice has been dragged along or the ice has dragged rocks along these features are just in the Nant Franken Valley. In fact, all of these three features are in the Nant Franken Valley. These features are called striation. So they indicate the ice movement, the direction of flow. So other classic features that we get of glaciation. Um, here's Helvellyn. Um, the feature I'm looking at is this great big feature right here. And it's in Welsh, a cum, corrie, a cirque or a tarn and it's red tarn obviously in striding edge there squirrel edge so how do they form well at the back wall this is a cross section the steep back wall you've got plucking that ice is plucking the rock and then as it moves down it's there's this rotational movement and it's abrading and it causes this rotational movement causes a depression and you get either a rock lip or you get glacial material that dams a lake. Doesn't always happen, but that's the formation of a cone. Sorry about that selfie there, but the next image is, they can be quite exciting and fun to, to play on uh, in Alpine style, but a very narrow knife edged ridge, the Coolin Ridge here, are fantastic examples of, and of course the Snowden Crib Gore, are an arete or ridge or crib, and they form um, a band of rock, essentially, which separates two valleys or cums. The next classic glacial feature of erosion will be this image here, which is an iconic mountain in the Alps called the Matterhorn. And right next to it is the um, Dont de Heron. So you've got the, the French word of Dont, like a tooth, and then you've got the German word a, um, a horn and they're both um, this feature that we get the Mont Blanc de Chaillon as well in the in the Swiss Alps but of course back in the UK we've also got these features here where we have glaciers on back on the backside of of the uh, the mountain eroding away at different sides and they're called pyramidal peaks So this diagram just illustrates that we have the arete, which would be a ridge that's running between two of these corries or cirques or tarns. And we get pronounced horns or we get slightly lower pyramidal peaks, but it illustrates the, the, the impact of glaciation on the landscape. Another feature that we associate, but not with the alpine glaciers, but with um, the, these valleys, you can see the shape of the valley here. Um, formed either by a continental ice sheet or by accumulation of, of alpine glaciers. So you can see here on the grey glacier in, this was in Chile, in uh, the Torres del Paine, uh, you can see a, an alpine glacier flowing down and joining this great big valley glacier. An image here, Glencoe as well, a fantastic example, you can see the shape of the U-shaped valley. So that's a classic glacial feature, you know, all throughout the UK, the northern, northern mountains. Another feature associated with a U-shaped valley are the smaller tributary glaciers, which are, remain, um, the power of the forces of erosion are much smaller. So they're left as a relic feature high up above the, the over deepened 
U-shaped valley, or I love the name of glacial trough because it's dug out and excavated. You can see this valley up here, and again, North Wales, Cumquion here as well, and all the comes in the Nantfranken. Again, the aspect is all, they're all pointing to the northeast. Um, they're called hanging valleys or hanging cums. And then you've got the classic U-shaped valley of, of uh, Nant Francon. And again, that's a, a, the image in, in Chile again of illustrating how that would form. Obviously, I'm living in North Wales, and I've got lots of examples of these uh, features from, from this, this, this mountainscape. Um, we've got the classic U-shaped valley, but the feature that I'm really interested in is this feature here. So the line or the ridge is dropped and it's cut down, it's curtailed, it's shortened. This side, the ridge line is coming down, the spur has come down, then it's been cut. This line here has been cut and shortened. Glencoe, again, great examples of how these ridges have been cut and curtailed and that feature is called a truncated spur. The feature in this image in New Zealand uh, is this river here. So what I'm trying to name is a glacial feature in a post-glacial environment of a river that's obviously not had the power to cut that valley. So Nampereis, that river has not cut that valley. It's too small to have cut that valley. Not in a power. So we call them in a post-glacial environment, we refer to these as being a misfit stream. And then the final feature that I'm going to look at, here we are up in um, the Lake District, looking down to Buttermere, sorry. We've got a feature here, the lake, which fills the bottom of the valley, like a long finger-like, um, uh, valley and it's been dammed by some glacial material here and continues along there. Um, here's an example in Patagonia again but these features are known as ribbon lakes. So we, we're going to jump now to a Kahoot so if you have your a phone ready if you've done these before if you grab a phone and type in a uh, if you type in on a Google search kahoot.it if you've done these before so here you go kahoot.it is here it's going to load a game pin and if you can punch in the pin 4826712 a few obviously people are are adept at this nowadays so that's fantastic so if you're not so interested in doing cahoots, then uh, we'll be here for a few minutes and then um, you can play along or you can just observe. That's great. Right, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna get started now because I'm aware of how much time is slipping by. Five questions on glaciers. Percentage of earth covered by glaciers. Ten percent of all the land on earth is covered by ice. It's phenomenal to think about how much is desert and vast areas like that. So well done Yeti. Question two, what percentage of all fresh water on earth is locked up in glaciers? Again, multiple, multiple guess really. How much of our fresh water is locked up in glacial ice? 70% of all fresh water on earth is locked up in ice. It's phenomenal, isn't it? What well in Sharon? The world's longest glacier is in Antarctica, but how long is it? It's vast. It's 400 kilometers, so convert that into miles. <laughs> 
few hundred and fifty miles long. So it's vast. It's a huge, huge glacier. Well done, Anna. True or false? Europe's largest glacier is in Iceland. It's true. Well done, Anna. You still up there? So, final question. The world's fastest recorded glacial surge in 53 in Pakistan. How much did it travel each day? So in two months, it traveled 12 kilometers, which estimates at one of those figures. <laughs> Hundred and ten meters. No, cool as ice. Who's cool as ice? Four out of five. And Hara, well done. Well done, Anna. But with five out of five, fantastic. Richard C. Well played there. Okay, well done for that little interlude there. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm just thinking about that question actually about the longest glacier. No, it is right. I'm, I'm sure I was like, is it or not? No, I just had a doubt then for a second. Anyway, if anyone corrects me, then stick it in the chat. But the longest glacier in Europe is in Iceland. Um, glaciers erode, but they also transport material and dump it. Um, and they leave various features. Um, and we've got all these features in the uplands of the mountains, but we've also got them in our lowlands as well and right on our coast. So this is in Clickyeth Bay on the west coast of, of Wales. And you can see this deposit or this cliff is really loose. And if we were to analyse that, we could differentiate it from other deposits. Um, and we could say, well, could it be a, this deposit or that or this or that? So what we'd like to do now is just try and bring in some of this analysis so that when you're out walking, you might see a profile of a deposit and see if it's solid or, or a drift, like this is a drift deposit, and try and work out what it could be from a few different things. So if we have a, a look, some of the things we might analyze is where is that deposit? Where is it in the landscape? So you can see this, if we just go back a second, we've got lots of massive, huge blocks that look like they've been a little bit rounded possibly. We've got um, a cliff here which is slumping at the bottom. It it's, looks like it's experiencing lots of erosion. It's got big rocks and little rocks in it. So we might look at the location. Where is that deposit in the landscape? We might think, are the fragments within that deposit, are they rounded or angular? So if they're smoothed or if they're just jagged, we might look at whether the fragments, we can call them clasts, if they're organised, you know, how are they organised into sizing or anything like that? Um, are they all similar sizes? Do they form layers? Do they all point in the same direction? So pebbles all have a long axis and that axis is sometimes they orientate and it tells you what's how it's been deposited has it slumped or pushed or or whatever so it can be an indicator might also look at the angle of that pebble are they all pointing up are they all pointing down are they all random but they can differentiate between a river deposit say and a glacial deposit lithology is a big fancy word for the origin of the rock so we can analyze the rock fragments and go right these are you know igneous rocks so there's no igneous rocks on the coast they, the closest igneous rocks might be in the mountains. So it gives us an idea of their origin, their lithology. What's the overall shape of the deposit? And is it active or relict feature? So we're gonna run through these now, and we're gonna, I'll keep those keys at the bottom, though those features, and we're gonna look at this feature here. So how would you identify that depositional feature? Is it active or not active? Well, it's 
looks like a beach to me, it's right by the sea. Are the pebbles rounded? Are they organized? Are they sorted? And that student there is looking at size and roundness and comparing maybe longshore drift processes and things. So if we were to analyze a beach, we might be able to try and bring out um, what differentiate that feature from a glacial feature. How about a windblown coastal environment where very, very fine grain, incredibly well sized, sorted, angular because they're, they're sandy grains. Lithology, the origin of these ground down fragments of, 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 of rock, um, the shape and so on. How about that feature? So we've got a, a cliff here and we've got material below it. So if we were to analyze the origin of these rocks, we'd find that they come from the parent material right up here. So they've fallen down through process of freeze thaw, periglacial activity. So freezing, thawing, weathering away at that rock, fallen down. So location, are there layers? Are they rounded? Are they angular? Where's the origin? And we would differentiate a scree deposit from a beach. Simple, but it's just interesting as we go into the glaciation in a second. So, um, an estuarine deposit so or it could be a lake deposit really you've got very fine muds low energy environment is settled down clay very well sorted fine layer again so we can illustrate that point and then we have a look at a river environment rounded pebbles organized they were flat so the angle and so on so we can differentiate that so let's have a look at this image here what do you see and this is an Eveline in the Valais in Switzerland. And we see huge blocks of rock and then fine um, fragments and then an even finer matrix of clay. So we get what's in an old uh, name for glacial till is boulder clay. And literally, when you look at it, it's, it's a descriptive term. There's boulders and there's every size particle right down to clay. Um, we know it is till, it's the glacial material, anything ground down, you can find it. This is, uh, I was cycling through Chile and I came across this years and years ago. Didn't know if I'd ever use it in, in the slideshow, but I took a photo of it. Um, and then just down near where I live in the North Wales coast near Bangor, we've got a glacial deposit here with big boulders, and something you might notice is the lower level is gray and the upper level is red. And the lower level is from the local origin of that rock is North Wales, whereas a lot of the rocks that come in the red layer have come from Northern England and Scotland. So we'll come on to our glacial history in a minute. Features that you see in the landscape. In Langdale here, these hummocky mounds, uh, in Commidwall, we've got these hummocky mounds and they're made of glacial till and they're called moraine. And this moraine at the front of this lake, so behind this lake, there's a glacier. The glacier has gone as far as this terminal moraine and retreated. And that moraine has trapped that proglacial lake. So there'll be lake sediments in here and we've got these, these, this till here. Um, so we've got a terminal moraine, maybe a lateral moraine on the side. So different types and names of moraines. Two huge blocks of limestone also sat on limestone. But where is the origin of these rocks? Is it, have they rolled there? Have they, have they are they from there themselves? Or have they been transported there? These are famous in North Yorkshire, the uh, Norba erratics. And they're grey whack rock and it's come from Northumberland and it's sitting on top of limestone pavement. Obviously, it's not rolled there, it's, it's been transported. And it's been transported up to 400 metres and dumped on the limestone um, pavement there. So it's incredible the power of ice to transport. And these blocks are known as erratics. So they're big individual blocks that have come from another valley, another source. So with deposits as well, we get lots of meltwater deposits. So where glaciers melt and they ablate, we get 
high energy, low energy environments, but we get all the material being dumped and deposited and they form different features. Um, so that's a low energy lake environment. Again, uh, Switzerland. So that was the Solheims Jakol in Iceland. This is uh, the Dies, I think it's the Dies Valley. Uh, well, it's the Dies Valley, but the Dies Glacier in, in Switzerland. And you can see the proglacial lake here. So the, all this material is on top of the ice that's on top of the glacier. And then you can see the dirty ice here, but then the, the beautiful blue with the, uh, the sediment um, on, a, on, on a lake on the side of a glacier in the Alps. So meltwater deposits. So down on my, just, just down the road from me on the coast, we've got a two meter ranging pole. We can see different layers in the deposit there. So this, we've got coarse material here and fine materials here, but you can definitely see lots and lots of layers. So these features that cross down like this indicate a high energy environment, a high energy river and riverbed environment called a fluvio glacial, so a river glacial deposit. And these features are cross bedding high energy and it indicates a melt out um, environment. So high energy, summer melt, um, fast moving. And then if we take a closer look at some of these very fine, if you were to put your hand in that and rub it up, you'll feel grit and then mud and grit and mud and grit and mud. And these little layers of grit and mud, so mud, would be laid down in very low energy, but grit will be transported and deposited in a high energy. So in that proglacial lake, summer, big melt, big material transported and deposited. In the winter, not much melting, fine layer. So you get coarse layer, fine layer, coarse layer, fine layer. And these deposits in the bottom of the lake are known as valves. Another, um, feature that we get in our landscape is something that happens underneath a glacier and they classic examples in Derwent water in you know, Keswick these lumps in the lake here these rounded mounds they're called drumlin from the the Gaelic for a rounded hill drum means rounded hill so they're formed under the glacier and ice flows over and it leaves this it's almost like a uh, an aerofoil shape and we can see these in in our landscape we can pick them out glaciologists have picked out all these drumlin fields Glasgow's built on them for instance but this image here illustrates how many there are in the British Isle and there's something like 65,000 drumlins across northern Britain and the British Isles in Ireland as well so it's a phenomenal extent Another feature that we get underneath the glacier made of sand and gravels are these long sinuous rivers which form under a glacier where there's melting so it's like a river and they form these these long uh, flows um, of stratified sand and gravel so this is a, a sand gravel pit just down the road from me and they're stratified layers and they're called esker but I don't want to talk massively more about all the depositional features there's lots and lots of evidence of all of these but it's by analyzing the deposits that you can see if it's till or if the sands and gravels um, and so on so this local one here is an old disused quarry for sand and gravel so it's great exposure so to get some perspective on glaciation we, we need to look at some of our old features now sea level change is not a modern phenomenon. Um, this lake in Loch Tarbert, here we've got um, relict features. These are old um, beaches that are relict and are much higher than the current sea level. So we have an active beach here, but these are relict beaches and they indicate where the sea level once was or where the land has changed. So there are two changes that we get Either the land will rise and fall, or the sea level will rise and fall. So sea level rising and falling is eustatic, but when the land rises and falls, it's a isostatic. So huge volume of ice pushing down on, on Britain has been released 
and the land has rebounded and that's isostatic rebound so these beaches are a response a, gla um, a geological response to less pressure and we get these raised beaches in Seljalands Foss uh, in Iceland that flat area where the people are walking is an old seafloor and there you can walk behind that waterfall but that waterfall was cut by wave action from the sea so it's not been cut by river processes but by coastal processes of undercutting erosion so it indicates the raising of the land after the ice has has been uh, reduced over that land but there's also evidence from uh, coral reefs because they always grow at the, just below the tidal level so we can look at sea level change where we find old relic um, we'll come back to that in the, in the short while but we get an idea of, of where sea levels were once higher or lower uh, depending on the climate from the past so just as an idea past global sea levels during the last ice age we're going to come to this in a minute the greatest extent of the ice is 20,000 years ago the sea level was 130 meters lower than today in the last warm period, 125,000 years ago, it was six meters higher than it is today, but 80 million years ago, it was anywhere from 170 to 250 meters higher than current level. So very, very warm climate 80 million years ago. So if we look at Ice Age Britain, um, we are currently gripped in an ice age. <laughs> Believe it or not, we're in a warm period, but we're in an ice age, but in a relatively warm period. And it's known as the Pleistocene era, and it began about 2.6 million years ago. But the term ice age is a bit misguided because it, we talk about the ice age from the early kind of scientists who believe that there's only one recent ice age or one really recent cold period. So we talk about the ice age, but really we should talk about glaciations and or glacial events, cold events, warm events, and a cycling within an ice age. But permanent ice began to form in Antarctica something like 40 million years ago, but then it became isolated as a landmass over Antarctica and started to cool because it was thermally disconnected, surrounded by the roaring 40s, and it got colder. And the colder it got, the more it grew white and reflected more sunlight. But also something really interesting happened that the um, landmass of North and South America joined and it changed ocean currents and it meant that tropical waters came up to Northern Europe and these tropical moist waters um, just rained down lots of precipitation so that the ocean currents and a landmass on Antarctica bring about this ice event. So this last ice age called the Pleistocene, we're in this current Flandrian interglacial between cold glacial periods. And it began about 11 and a half thousand years ago. But our most recent glaciation, and that image depicts it, um, where ice basically goes from Holland Grimsby right through Derby and down to Cardiff, that's as far as it got about 20,000 years ago. But the ice was maybe a one and a half kilometers thick um, and that's known as the glacial maximum it came down here the glacial maximum but ice actually came down to north london 400,000 years ago in a previous glacial and there's evidence of that um, in there's till in london when they were digging the the uh, um, the uh, in the victorian times they were digging the, the tunnel system and they got to north london finchley road and they saw glacial till. So our climate has gone, in the last half million years, we've got a little warm period, a long cold period, a short warm, long cold, short warm, long cold. So these are glacial periods, these are interglacial periods, and we are now in a warmer interglacial. So this is part of a two million year process, and it's at a short, um, period within that uh, you know a short warm period these glaciations are much longer the last one was lasted for about a hundred thousand years but the coldest point that glacial maximum was twenty thousand years ago I'll talk about how we know this how the scientists know this 
um, in a bit. So, woolly mammoths. There are 50,000 fossilized tusks have been found in the bed of the North Sea. So people have been dredging them up, fossilized bone, 50,000. So that's a phenomenal number of woolly mammoths that lived in Britain until 14,000 years ago. They died out about 4,000 years ago, but it's evidence of a very, very recent, very cold period. But then at the previous warm period here, 120,000 years ago, hippo bones were found under Nelson's column, actually. So when they were excavating, so we've got hippos and we've got a savanna environment with lions and hippos in Britain in the last warm period. And now we're in this current warm period. Uh, we thankfully haven't got any lions or hippos, but um, it just illustrates that where we are in terms of our climate, we've been very cold and we've been much warmer than we are. And we've got these records and from people have found these, the bones of lion in Worcestershire and perfectly on the North Thames. But we also get these cold periods. So we're now in this warm period, but within this warm period, we get cold periods and warm periods. And you may have come across the Little Ice Age. It's a cold period in our interglacial, and they're known as a stadial. And it started about 13th century, lasts until the mid 19th century. And London had a frost fair uh, for 200 years and the Thames would freeze over and um, they didn't need bridges because it would freeze and you wouldn't get the taxes using the old bridges. Um, so, you know, it, it's got, we've got an interesting history. But so the evidence is, is there for this mini ice age. We've got climate uh, data from 5,000 years ago when the first settlers stayed and, and the Neolithics in Britain. We got this longish warm period, cold blip. And then in the dark age, it went cold and it went warm in the medieval time. And then it went cold again during the little ice age. So evidence we've got from grape harvests varying in 1488 in October the 17th, seven years later, about 40 days prior to that. So that was obviously a warm period and this was a longer. And we have the same, um, today we have uh, the grape harvests and flowers come into flower at different times of the year. So the climate, we've looked at it from the last ice age, We've looked at it from this last little warm period. So different timescales. I know we're jumping quite a lot, but if we go to the Earth's history, the Earth has experienced, from what scientists know, five cold ice houses in its four and a half billion year history, known as five ice ages, and we are currently in one. Cold climates are not common. So 15% of the world's history is represented in these cold environments where we have permanent ice on one or both of our poles. So ice house earth, and then we've also got the opposite, which is greenhouse earth, which represents 85% of the history. So how do we know this? We've got deep sea sediments and lake sediments, and we've got relict landforms. I'm gonna skip over this because we are running out of time, but I can share this presentation with you later, but we have thematic ancient um, history of our, of our climate. Um, we have evidence of rocks being dropped off icebergs into lake sediments and marine sediments like drop stones. So that's evidence. And if you go to the Sahara Desert, you'll find ancient till. So you'll find ancient glacial till in the desert, which is kind of bizarre, but it illustrates that the land was once over Antarctica, but also a much colder environment. And today we in the Sahara, we find the evidence of glaciations. And then again, we have the sea level and the height of where the, um, the tropical reefs form. So we have these things called a paleo thermometer. In essence, it's all to do with oxygen. The scientists understand that there's different types of oxygen, light forms and heavy forms. So a light form, will evaporate quickly and fall as rain and run off into the sea. But in a cold environment, 
that light form will land in ice or fall as ice and condense and fall as ice and be trapped so that the heavy oxygen will be in the water. Little animals um, actually build their, their, their shells from calcium carbonate and they use the oxygen. So the ratios of the heavy to the light indicates through sediment sampling, that ratio indicates the past climate. So it's all to do with different amounts of oxygen. It's complicated, but ice cores as well trap air and they look at carbon dioxide and again we get these traces these ancient paleo thermometers which illustrate um, and help scientists understand our glacial past like that so again another graph we've seen this earlier but in a different form but you can see it talked about marine oxygen and so that's our paleo thermometer that helps build a record of our past i don't want to dwell on it one thing I will show is this layer is an Icelandic volcano uh, that erupted about 50,000 years ago and it was recorded in the Greenland ice sheet. I'm gonna not, haven't got time to show this video, but I'll leave, I'll leave this for you to um, observe uh, and I can share that with you. The final thing I just want to mention, the Milankovic cycle. So these are kind of eccentricities of our orbit in space. So, we go closer and further from the sun on a 100,000 year cycle, which can, it doesn't indicate that an ice age is gonna happen, but it certainly has an impact on them and the regularity. This Milankovic was a Serbian mathematician and a climatologist, and he, he kind of came up, he, 100 years ago or so, and he studied um, the effects of our um, or our eccentric orbit. So it's phenomenal um, knowledge that he created. But he understood that the Earth tilts as well. So we tilt a few degrees from 21 to 24 degrees over a 43,000 year. So the closer we are to vertical, the more impact we're going to have by the by the effects of the solar radiation. Another of these orbits that um, he uh, identified was something called precession, which is like a wobble. So we wobble, we tilt, and we go closer and further from the sun. And these combined, and they do have an impact on glaciations and global climates, but really their impact is more of a pacemaker, I guess, than causative. But Milankovic, he came up with these kind of ideas. So. Um, We've had a whistle stop travel right the way through um, glaciation, our glacier history, some of the causes and the evidence of glaciation. I'll share the presentation with you at the end. Um, there's, I know there's a couple of questions. Uh, are there good books? I can answer. Are there any good books on the topic you would suggest? There's one I've got, uh, Ron Redfern, called Origins, which is fantastic. I love it. It's a table, coffee table book. Um, why does Scotland have taller mountains and say North Wales? Paul Gannon is perfect to answer that question for you. Um, he was giving a talk next week as it happens on uh, the Alps and the formation of the Alps. Um, if there's any questions that come in, and I haven't got time to answer them, then uh, I'll answer them and I'll send feedback to you in an email in a bit. But I'll just, before we finish, two more webinars in this series, Geology of the Alps, uh, Paul Gannon talking next Thursday, and then I've got John Roberts talking about archeology span in the mountains, uh, which will be both of them fascinating and stunning. So at the same time, the next two weeks, I'll be running workshops in 2021 if you wanna get to do a day like this, but in the mountains, then I do glacial workshops. Um, I keep plugging my cars that come out. I'm gonna do a very, if you have two minutes, I'm gonna do a quick giveaway for a pack of cards. So if you would like to win a pack of my brand new playing cards, I put all your names into here and I'm gonna give it a spin. And one of you is, if you give me your, 
address at the end. Oh, looks like it could be Heather Oli. You just won a pack of my brand new playing cards. Well done, Heather. Um, and then just finally, I've got a new feedback. I've got a couple of questions. And um, if you have time to answer them, if you type in on your phone again, menti.com on a Google search or a web browser search, type in menti.com and a code and there's two questions about what you what you've got from this webinar so if you enter the code 58928981 i just would really appreciate your feedback so one thing what did you learn so that code um, is at the top of the screen here's 58 nine two eight nine one looks like something went wrong possibly there how jomlins were formed how fast can glaciers move um there's one in iceland moving at 40 meters per day the one in um pakistan was moving at 112 meters a day how jumblins were formed, subglacial. So they're very hard to know because you can't really get under a glacier to see how they're formed. So it's always a still unknown. Um, one thing you learn about us being in an ice age. And then what I find incredible is we are still in an ice age. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that code up and I would love to have your feedback on all of this. So thank you for, for um, sharing your thoughts there. These, these will come in. I'm aware that it's just gone um, seven o'clock. And uh, yeah, I recommend Earth Story as a good TV series. Some episodes are on YouTube. I mean, I'll share the links that I've, I've got as well. I'll share the presentation. You get the links from that. Um, so I'll, I'll review back on your comments from the chat um, and uh, I'll keen to see all your comments as well. So thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Um, and uh, yes, hopefully we'll see you again. Um, but anyway, for me, it's bye-bye for now. Okay, thank you very much again.